Hello and welcome back to the Crime Reel. This week we have a fascinating compilation of stories looking at female serial killers. We start today's video with a story that is new to our channel, looking at the extremely disturbing case of Joanna Dennehy, who has been referred to as the most dangerous woman in the British prison system. Joanna was born in August 1982 and grew up in St Albans in Hertfordshire, England. Somewhat unusually for these kind of cases, Joanna grew up in a loving home with a stable lifestyle. She lived with her mother, Kathleen, who worked as a shop assistant, her father, Kevin, who was a security guard, and a younger sister named Maria. During her younger childhood, she did well at school, was liked by her teachers, and loved reading. However, this all started to change in her teenage years. She started experimenting with drink and drugs and began hanging around with petty criminals. Joanna started a relationship with a man by the name of John Trainer, and at the age of 15, following an argument with her mother, Joanna left home and never returned. John was five years older than Joanna and has since said that they did not start a sexual relationship until she reached the age of consent, which is 16 in the United Kingdom. The couple were homeless and would sleep wherever they could, something that John hated but didn't really bother Joanna. They eventually ended up in shared housing and, at the age of 17, Joanna fell pregnant with their first child. According to John, although the baby was unplanned, Joanna was happy about their news and gave up drinking and smoking while she was pregnant. However, once the child, a daughter, was born, her behaviour drastically changed. She was often distant towards the child and was known to be drunk or on drugs whilst taking care of her. John and Joanna fell into a dysfunctional pattern where Joanna would attempt to make their relationship work but then would spiral into drink, drugs, violence and infidelity. John would leave but then take her back. After their second daughter was born, Joanna's behaviour became even more extreme. She would carry a knife in one of her boots threatened to firebomb houses and said that she could kill someone. Tired of the violence and abuse, John moved out taking their daughters with him. In 2012, Joanna was admitted to a psychiatric unit in Peterborough. She had a history of depression and self-harm and at this point was diagnosed with a series of psychopathic and other disorders as a result of her anger, impulsivity and violence. Joanna moved to a bedsit on the outskirts of Peterborough, which she rented from a man by the name of Kevin Lee. Joanna would act as his enforcer, threatening and intimidating people into paying their outstanding debts in return for her rent. Kevin Lee was a 48-year-old father of two who was reported missing by his family on the 29th of March 2013. The following day, his burnt-out Ford Mondeo was found in the countryside at a farm in Yaxley, South Peterborough. As concerns for Kevin's safety increased, a man out walking his dog came across a body dumped in a remote ditch. It was soon established that this was Kevin's body. He had been stabbed through the heart. He had been placed face down and was naked below the waist. On the top half of his body, he was wearing a sequined dress. It would seem that the perpetrator had not only killed him, but tried to humiliate him as well. Understandably, his family were devastated by his death, adding that he was a wonderful husband, father, loving brother and son. His naturally infectious personality touched everyone who knew him. The police believe that Kevin knew his killer, and within hours of the investigation starting, mobile phone data placed 30-year-old Joanna at the site of his burnt-out car, as well as a second person, Gary Richards. Gary, who went by the name Gary Stretch, was 7 foot 3 inches tall. He was known to the police and had a string of burglary convictions. Joanna and Gary had both disappeared. The police launched a nationwide appeal knowing that they were both extremely dangerous. 
The police were gradually closing in on them as the pair made it to the home of a previous criminal contact. Here they posed for a series of bizarre photographs, including the now infamous picture of Joanna sitting in an armchair pretending to lick a knife. Others showed multiple scars on Joanna's arms and stomach from years of self-harm. With no money and only some stolen goods, Gary reached out to someone to help him sell them on. This man was Mark Lloyd. When Mark met up with the pair, he was shocked by Joanna's behaviour. She pulled a knife on him and boasted of killing people, showing him pictures as proof. Mark played along out of fear and convinced the pair that he had a contact who would buy the goods. The three of them left in a car to go and sell the stuff. As they drove around, it became clear that Joanna was on the hunt for her next victim. She told Gary that she wanted him to find her one. Gary spotted a man walking with a black Labrador and asked, Will he do? Joanna said yes and jumped from the car and stabbed the man. Mark tried to escape, but Gary grabbed him, saying that there was nothing he could do and he should just let Joanna do her thing. The group drove away and Joanna said that she wanted Gary to find her another man with a dog. Once again, a random man was spotted and Joanna jumped out of the car, stabbing the man dozens of times. There was blood everywhere and as the man tried to crawl away, Joanna happily returned to the car with the man's dog and Gary calmly said that it was now time to go to Tesco's. Tesco's is a well-known supermarket chain. The police were very close behind both attacks and caught up with Joanna and Gary soon afterwards. Joanna was arrested in the car where she was still holding the dog that she had taken from her second victim. Meanwhile, Gary made a run for it, but was caught by the police. Mark did not face any charges. The men who had been stabbed, 64-year-old Robin Bereza and John Rogers, who was 57, were not expected to recover. Amazingly, against all odds, both of them pulled through. As Joanna was arrested and booked, she was in an upbeat, happy mood and seemed far more concerned about the dog than her victims. Video footage of her being booked showed her flirting with police officers and even saying, Attempted murder and murder is nothing. It's like going down for a Sunday roast. Easy. Adding that, and using her exact quote, she said, It could be worse. I could be big, fat, black and ugly. Despite now being in custody, Joanna had further shocks in store for the investigating team. The day after her arrest, they received a call to say that two more bodies had been found, approximately 10 miles from where Kevin Lee had been discovered. Both of these men had been stabbed and dumped in a ditch, and crucially, both men had a connection to Joanna. They were identified as John Chapman, a 56-year-old widower who was a Royal Navy veteran. He rented a room in the same house as Joanna. And 31-year-old Lucas Slabaseski, who had believed that he was heading into a romantic relationship with Joanna after a string of suggestive text messages. He was last seen heading to her home. It was established that Lucas was the first to have been killed. Although he had been missing for longer than Kevin, whose body was found first, Lucas did not have any family in the country to report him missing. Joanna had stabbed Lucas to death and then put his body in a wheelie bin. She even reportedly showed this to a 14-year-old girl. She took photographs of Lucas's dead body that she had shown to Mark when she was intimidating him into helping her and Gary sell the stolen goods. John was killed after Lucas. He had been drinking heavily and was under the influence of drugs at the time of his death. He too had been stabbed multiple times. The police recovered a blood-soaked mattress in the garden of the property where he and Joanna lived. After this third murder, Joanna called a friend and sang the Britney Spears song, Oops, I Did It Again. During police interviews, Joanna continued to demonstrate her need to be in control of the situation. Whilst the police were hoping that they would be able to piece together the motives behind the attacks, she replied, no comment, to every question. Her behaviour was completely different to the carefree woman who had been arrested and brought into custody. 
She was charged with three murders and two attempted murders. After her capture, she was diagnosed with a psychopathic disorder characterized by a superficial charm, callous disregard for others, pathological lying, and diminished capacity for remorse. Many of the people who knew her talked of how they were drawn to her personality and charisma and being under her spell. As the legal team began preparing her case, those connected to the attacks hoped that the full story of why this happened would emerge at trial. Yet again, Joanna needed to be in control and saw another opportunity to shock. The first day of the trial was expected to be a formality with Joanna entering a not guilty plea. However, in a move which shocked everyone, in particular her legal team, when she was asked how she would plead, she shouted, guilty, 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 telling Mr Justice Sweeney that she did not wish to discuss her pleas with her defence lawyers, stating, I've pleaded guilty and that's that. Shortly afterwards, Joanna was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole by Judge Robin Spencer. She smirked as he handed down the sentence. At the time, she was only the third British woman to ever receive such a sentence, following Rose West, who tortured and killed at least nine young women in the 1970s and 80s with her husband Fred West and Myra Hindley, who, together with her partner Ian Brady, was responsible for the murders of five children in the 1960s. Since Joanna's conviction, this sentence has also been handed down to Lucy Letby, the neonatal nurse who was convicted of the murders of seven babies and the attempted murder of seven others in 2023. Gary was found guilty for his part in the crimes and sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 19 years. Joanna is completing her sentence in Bronzefield Prison in Surrey. It is known that she has become pen pals with multiple men outside of prison, once again winning them over with her charismatic personality and has received a proposal of marriage from at least one of these men. In May 2016, it was reported that she had lost a High Court claim stating that she is entitled to damages for human rights violations after being put in solitary confinement. She claimed that she had been upset after being segregated whilst in prison. In a 2017 interview, Joanna's mother said, The girl that killed those people is not my daughter. My daughter is that nice 16-year-old that never came home. When I saw this footage of Jo, it was like somebody I didn't know. She's standing there being charged, smiling and laughing. That's not the kind, loving Jo that was our baby. To me, she doesn't exist anymore. I don't ever want her to come out of jail. The world's safer without Joanna in it. Two years later, Joanna's daughter, Cheyenne Trainer, said that her mother deserved to die in prison and has apologised to her mother's victims for her horrendous crimes. Joanna's ex-partner, John Trainer, had said that he would support the death penalty in Joanna's case. That concludes the first story today. Please click the subscribe button and add any comments down below. Psst. In prison, a psychiatrist diagnosed Joanna having paraphilia sadomasochism, which is the need to inflict and receive pain and humiliation during sex. One clue to this was when she even wore handcuffs attached to her trousers. Goodbye. For this true crime story, we shall be returning to 1950s Georgia to look at the case of Anjette Lyles, the popular owner of a local restaurant in the city of Macon. Anjette Donovan was born on the 23rd of August 1925. She was the only daughter of William and Jetta Donovan. As a young child, her parents moved to Macon in Georgia, where the family settled. At that time, Macon was a small city with a relatively low crime rate, where residents looked out for one and another and were comfortable leaving their doors unlocked. In October 1947, at the age of 22, Anjette married Ben Lyles at the Mulberry Street Methodist Church. Ben, his brother Joe and their mother, Julia, were quite well known in the area as they owned and operated Lyles Restaurant. 
It was a popular eatery on Mulberry Street. Within weeks of their wedding, Anjette found out that she was expecting their first child. Ben also bought his brother out of the restaurant, so life was pretty hectic for the young couple. Anjette gave birth to a daughter, who they named Marcia Elaine, on the 24th of July 1948. It was around this time that Ben began to drink heavily and, coupled with injuries that he had sustained during his time serving in the Second World War, he spent less and less time working at the restaurant. In need of money, Anjette had no choice but to run the restaurant herself and began working there most days, often with baby Marcia in tow. Anjette found herself enjoying her work and while she was supported by Ben's mother, Julia, it was Anjette who became the heart and soul of the restaurant. She was popular and personable, spending time with her customers, and the restaurant became as popular for the atmosphere and community spirit as it did for the food. Even when pregnant with their second child, Carla, who was born on the 18th of May 1951, Anjette continued to work long hours at the restaurant, building the business still further. With Ben still drinking more and more to excess, he became distanced from the business, and perhaps failing to see how much it was thriving, he decided to sell the restaurant in late 1951, without even consulting Anjette. She was reportedly devastated, but did not have time to dwell on his decision as, in January 1952, Ben's health took a turn for the worse. By the 23rd of January, he had been admitted to hospital. He was bleeding from his nose and mouth, was delirious, vomiting, twitching, and had rapid breathing and had swollen limbs. Just two days later, he passed away. Widowed with two young children to care for, Anjette maintained a close relationship with her mother-in-law, Julia, who would spend large periods of time living with Anjette to assist with the children. However, determined to get her life back on track, Anjette worked hard, and in April 1955, three years after her husband's death, she bought back the original Lyles restaurant and reopened it under the name Anjette's Restaurant. On the day of the opening of her new restaurant, she met 26-year-old Joe Neil Gabbert. Joe was an airline pilot who was smitten with Anjette from the moment he met her, and, after a whirlwind romance, the pair married in the summer of 1955. A few months later, Joe had to go into hospital for a minor operation on his wrist. Anjette was constantly by his side, keeping him company, looking after him and making sure that he had enough to eat and drink. Shortly after the operation, Joe developed a rash all over his body. It became increasingly itchy and sore, and the more he scratched it, the worse it became. A registered nurse, Jenny Ingalls, was assigned to look after Joe, and he agreed to let her tie his hands in an attempt to prevent him from scratching. His condition, which was believed to be due to a reaction to the anaesthetic, began to improve and he was discharged from hospital. However, once back at home, the rash returned with a vengeance. Anjette and Ben's mother, Julia, attempted to look after him. The nurse, Jenny, would visit once a day to assist them and was really shocked by how quickly Joe's condition deteriorated. It soon got to the point where he was unable to do anything for himself. Eventually, Joe had to be fed intravenously. On the 30th of November 1955, even this became impossible when his veins collapsed, and Jenny told Anjette that Joe would die unless they got him to the hospital. An ambulance was called, and Joe was rushed to the veterans' hospital. However, it was too late for him to be saved, and on the 2nd of December 1955, he passed away. After his death, Anjette continued to run the restaurant and reverted back to her first married name, Anjette Lyles, so that she would have the same surname as her children. She remained very close with Julia, her first mother-in-law, who continued to help with the restaurant, children and looking after the house. However, some 20 months after Joe's death, Julia was at the restaurant when she was suddenly taken ill. Her face became discoloured and she began vomiting blood. 
Julia was taken to Anjette's home, where she stayed until the 28th of August 1957, when she was then taken to hospital with symptoms of pigmentation of the skin and peripheral neuropathy. Anjette visited her mother-in-law frequently until Julia succumbed to her illness on the 29th of September 1957. With Anjette being a popular member of the local community, she received a great deal of support after what was seen as her tragically bad luck, losing two husbands and her mother-in-law in the space of only five years. Then the following year, tragedy would strike again. Around 6pm on March the 2nd, 1958, Anjette arrived at the restaurant with her daughters, nine-year-old Marcia and seven-year-old Carla. Marcia was coughing and complaining of having a headache and feeling generally unwell. She begged her mother to take her home, but instead Anjette gave her a spoonful of sugar covered in whiskey in an attempt to alleviate her symptoms. By 8pm that evening, Marcia was vomiting violently and Anjette finally agreed to take the child home. Three days later, Marcia was admitted to the same hospital where her father, stepfather and grandmother had died. Within days, Anjette had started telling people that Marcia too was going to die. By the 22nd of March, 20 days after Marcia first fell ill, Anjette had ordered a special casket for her daughter and made arrangements for the children's choir at the church to sing at Marcia's funeral. She made these arrangements despite the fact that, at the time, her nine-year-old daughter was still alive. Marcia was gravely ill and suffering a great deal. Forceful vomiting, nausea, oral bleeding and kidney failure were accompanied by vivid delusions. She thought that beasts were coming after her, that insects were attacking her and that there were worms crawling out of her fingers. She would cling in terror to those near her. However, when Anjette visited her daughter and saw these delusions, she found them quite comical and laughed about what her daughter said. Marcia died on the 5th of April 1958. Anjette reportedly showed no sign of grief. However, after this death, things would be different. Noticing Anjette's suspicious behaviour, one of the employees at the restaurant wrote an anonymous letter to one of Marcia's aunts. This letter was then passed to the coroner of Bibb County, and an autopsy was performed on the young girl. When the coroner, Dr. Campbell, informed Anjette about the anonymous letter that accused her of poisoning her own child, Anjette showed no reaction. However, the following day, she visited Dr. Campbell again, this time with her younger daughter, Carla. She made Carla tell the doctor a story of how she and her sister had played doctor with some friends, the Jones twins, and during the game they had been playing with ant poison. The doctor insisted that Anjette immediately called the twins' mother to inform them of the incident. Anjette picked up the telephone directory at the doctor's office, located and dialed the number and told the person on the other end of the line that she feared that the twins had come into contact with arsenic. At this meeting with the doctor, Anjette also presented a letter from her mother-in-law, Julia, in which Julia stated that she was responsible for her son Ben's death and then went on to apologise for the hurt that she caused. A toxicologist analysed tissue from Marcia's body and found it to contain arsenic at levels sufficient to cause death in a human being. From the test performed, it could be concluded that arsenic had been given at multiple different times, with a large quantity being consumed in the four days before Marcia's death. Ben, Joe and Julia's bodies were exhumed, and it was concluded that each died from multiple doses of arsenic poisoning. Anjette was arrested on the 6th of May 1958 and charged with four counts of murder. Anjette denied everything, but by the time her case went to trial, the evidence against her was compelling. The prosecution noted that her motive in the murders was financial gain. When her first husband, Ben, died, she received over $12,000, which is the equivalent of around $140,000 today, together with a monthly payout of $150 for her and $47 for each of their two daughters. Three days before her second marriage, the Veterans Administration received a letter purportedly from Joe checking the status of his insurance and that his premiums were up to date. 
An expert examiner from the State Crime Laboratory tested that the letter had not been written or signed by Joe. After Joe married Anjette, she was made the beneficiary of this insurance and received just over $10,000 upon his death. A second life insurance policy also paid her a further $10,000. Julia's will made Anjette and her two daughters the beneficiary of her estate and they received a sum of just over $11,000 after Julia's death. However, it was discovered that the will was dated the 20th of August 1957. By this time, Julia was virtually paralysed and so weak that she could not press the hospital buzzer and was definitely not in a position to hold a pen. Tracing paper was found at Anjette's home, matching the forged signature on the document. Additionally, Anjette took out a policy on the life of her daughter, for which she was the beneficiary. Over the course of the trial, the prosecution called numerous witnesses. A doctor testified that the rash on Joe's body was consistent with dermatitis caused by arsenic. A fellow patient at the hospital with Joe, who happened to be an attorney, stated that Anjette seemed more concerned about asking him to help Joe make a will than the fact that Joe was clearly at death's door. Joe's nurse, Jenny, recounted multiple concerning statements that Anjette had made to her, including boasting about the insurance money that she would receive, telling Jenny to state that Joe had the best possible treatment if questioned by his family, and how much she hated her mother-in-law and wished that she was dead. An owner of a car dealership testified that Anjette had approached him about buying a car and when asked for the down payment, Anjette said that she would have it the following month as her mother-in-law would soon be dead. Many people testified that Anjette told them that she hated Joe and would have divorced him had he not died. Staff at the restaurant would testify that they had seen Anjette prepare drinks, take them into the toilet together with a notebook, then leave and take these drinks to the hospital, with the patient often claiming that these drinks tasted strange. They'd also regularly seen Anjette with a bottle of taro ant poison, which is known to contain arsenic. One witness saw Anjette make a drink of lemonade, disappear into the toilet, return to the restaurant, stir the drink, then sniff it, and touched it to her lips. She then took this drink to her daughter at the hospital. The following day, Anjette had sores and a rash appear on her lips where the liquid had touched them. A witness also testified how she heard Anjette talking to her daughter, saying, You little Lyles looking son of a bitch. I'll kill you if it's the last thing I do. It was then established that Anjette had never called the twins' mother from the doctor's office to warn her of the possible arsenic exposure. The woman's telephone number was not listed in the telephone directory and the call that Anjette placed was actually to her own home. Newspaper reports at the time sensationalised details of items that were found inside Anjette's house with headlines such as Voodoo Cultist and Playgirl Widow. With the worldwide news coverage, the trial attracted record crowds and the prosecution successfully demonstrated how Anjette had a deliberate premeditated plan to commit murder for financial gain. She was found guilty and sentenced to death by electric chair. She showed no emotion as her fate was read out. On the 15th of October 1959, it was reported that three doctors appointed by the governor to examine Anjette stated, We find Miss Anjette Donovan Lyles to be psychotic and insane. The type of her mental illness is chronic paranoid schizophrenic and her sentence was commuted to involuntary commitment she was then sent to Central State Hospital in Milledgeville, Georgia, a large facility specialising in the treatment of mental illness. With this, the debate began as to whether Anjet was in fact psychotic and insane, as ruled by the Sanity Commission on in fact the best actress of 1959. Either way, she was never released and died at the hospital on the 4th of December 1977 at the age of 52. That concludes today's story. Please subscribe if you're new to the channel and please add any comments down below. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Some reports say that when Anjette was in the hospital, 
She was quoted as saying, they think I'm a crazy as hell and I'm going to let them keep thinking it because if they don't, they're going to fry my arm. Goodbye. For today's true crime narration, we shall be looking at the life of Margie Velma Barfield, a controversial case of a serial killer who became known in the press as Death Row Granny, and whether she was indeed a heartless monster, or a woman who was so befuddled by her addiction to prescription medication that she went to extraordinary lengths to get her hands on her next fix. Margie Velma Bullard, who always went by her middle name of Velma, was born on the 29th of October 1932 in South Carolina, America. She was the second child and first daughter of the nine children born to Murphy and Lillian Bullard. The family lived in harsh, cramped conditions near Fayetteville in North Carolina where they had no electricity, running water or access to any form of outhouse or toilet. During the Great Depression, they fell further into poverty and Velma's childhood was far from being a happy one. Her father, Murphy, was a strict imposing man who was easily angered and drank heavily. He had a quick temper and was hysterically jealous of his wife whilst being repeatedly unfaithful himself. Lillian feared her husband's temper and remained submissive to him at all times, doing nothing to protect her children from their father's wrath. Velma would often forgive her father for his outbursts and violence, justifying his behaviour as typical of a man. But then she would remain angry at her mother for failing to protect her. In 1939, at the age of seven, Velma started school. She achieved good grades and enjoyed her time there, as it gave her a respite from her bleak home life. However, before long, she became a target for other children to bully, picking on her due to her family's poverty. As a result of this, she began sneaking out of school and on one occasion was caught stealing money from an elderly neighbour. She was beaten by her father and there were no further known incidents of theft during her childhood. Despite the violent outbursts, Velma was often perceived as being daddy's little girl. His oldest daughter becoming his favourite, it was many years later that Velma stated that her father had been sexually abusing her during this time, a fact that was vehemently denied by her brothers but supported by at least one of her sisters. On the 1st of December 1949, at the age of 17, Velma married her school sweetheart. He was 18-year-old Thomas Burke and this provided her with an escape route from her family home. Thomas had various different jobs, working in a cotton mill, as a farm labourer and driving a delivery truck whilst Velma worked in a pharmacy. They welcomed their first child on the 15th of December 1951, a boy who they named Ronald and then two years later in September 1953 their daughter Kim was born. Velma loved being a mother, she was indulgent and protective and enjoyed spending time with her children. When they started school, she would always be one of the first to volunteer to help out. By this time, Thomas had got a job as a delivery driver for Pepsi-Cola and Velma worked at night at a nearby textile plant. This gave them enough money to move to a small but comfortable house in Parkton where they enjoyed many happy years of family life. This began to change when, at the young age of 31, Velma had to have a hysterectomy the operation had a profound and negative effect on her well-being and her personality changed quite drastically as a result. She became anxious and depressed and began to suffer from other ailments, including severe back pain. At around the same time, Thomas had been drinking more, something that Velma had always been opposed to and in 1965 Thomas had a car accident. He was knocked unconscious after falling asleep at the wheel, but Velma believed that it was because he had been drinking and their relationship began to deteriorate into a series of bitter arguments. Two years later, Thomas was arrested for drunk driving and as a result he lost his driver's license and along with it, his job at Pepsi-Cola. He fell into a depression and as a result began drinking even more heavily. This situation also took a toll on Velma, who was dealing with her own physical and mental illnesses. She became ever more anxious and was quickly losing weight. 
At one point after collapsing at home, she was hospitalised for a week and then discharged with a prescription for Librium, a psychotropic drug which is used to treat anxiety disorders which is now known to be habit forming. After being discharged from hospital, she began taking Librium in higher doses than what she had been prescribed and also began getting treatment from other doctors for this and other medications. Each doctor was unaware of the other and her drug use began to increase. As her drug addiction took hold, her children often found their mother passed out and would hunt for her hidden pill bottles and throw them away just as Velma herself was searching for and disposing of the alcohol which Thomas was hiding. On the 21st of April 1969, whilst the children were at school, Velma returned from the laundrette to find that her house was on fire. There was minimal fire damage, but inside, 38-year-old Thomas was found dead. He had died from asphyxiation together with the family dog, Termite, and cat, Sadie. It was deemed that the fire had been caused by Thomas smoking whilst in bed, drunk. Not long after Thomas's death, Velma began dating a widow by the name of Jennings Barfield. Jennings' wife had died around the same time as Thomas. He was 16 years older than Velma and had retired early from his career in the civil service due to his ill health, having been diagnosed with diabetes, emphysema and heart disease. Velma and Jennings married on the 23rd of August 1970, but were soon having marital troubles, particularly due to Velma's addiction to medication. It seemed that divorce was on the cards, but on the 21st of March 1971, Jennings died from heart failure. In order to support herself, Velma began working at Belk's department store, but her poor performance and attitude led to her being removed from the shop floor into the stockroom before ultimately being sacked. At around this time, her father died and she was arrested for forging a prescription for which she was given a suspended sentence. Three years later, in the summer of 1974, Velma's mother, Lillian, became very ill with intense diarrhoea and vomiting. She recovered within a few days, only for the symptoms to return over the Christmas period that year. She was admitted to hospital on 30th December 1974 and sadly died within hours. Shortly before her death, Lillian had spoken to one of her sons expressing concern about a letter that she had received saying that if she did not pay her car loan, her car would be repossessed. She was worried because she did not have a car loan, but her son reassured her that it was likely just an administration error. However, it was later discovered that this was a loan that Velma had taken out whilst pretending to be Lillian. A year later, Velma was convicted of seven counts of writing bad checks, which she was doing in order to finance her prescription drug habit and was then sentenced to six months in prison. She served three months of her sentence and after her release decided to seek employment looking after the elderly. She began caring for 94-year-old Montgomery Edwards and his wife Dolly who was 84. Montgomery was bedridden and incontinent, had diabetes which had led to the amputation of both of his legs and was blind. Dolly was a cancer survivor who at 84 struggled with the care of her husband. On the 29th of January 1977, Montgomery died after a bout of what was thought to be gastroenteritis. At his age and with his extensive medical problems, his death was not unexpected. Just over a month later, Dolly began experiencing the same symptoms as her husband, extreme stomach pain and violent sickness and diarrhoea. Dolly died on the 1st of March 1977. Velma began dating a relative of Dolly's, Stuart Taylor, a widower and tobacco farmer. She also took a job caring for a 76-year-old by the name of Record Lee, who had broken her leg. When Record and her 80-year-old husband, John, found that a cheque had been cashed in their name, they called the police. But with no knowledge as to the source of the cheque, this wasn't pursued. Just a couple of months later, John became ill with extreme stomach pains, diarrhoea and sickness. He was taken to hospital where he remained for a week with what was determined to be a virus. Once he was discharged, his symptoms would come and go at regular intervals until, on the 4th of June 1977, he was taken to hospital with stomach and chest pains where he finally succumbed to his illness. Meanwhile, Velma and Stuart were planning to marry 
They regularly attended the Sunday service in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and it was during one such visit that Stuart was taken ill. Convinced that he had an upset stomach from something that he had eaten, Stuart went back to his truck to wait for Velma. By the time the service had finished and Velma returned to the truck, Stuart was in agony and Velma took him to the local hospital. Stuart was diagnosed with gastroenteritis, prescribed some medicine and sent home. His condition began to improve before suddenly taking a turn for the worse. Stuart was suffering from extreme vomiting and diarrhoea. He was sweating profusely and was thrashing about in bed making incoherent noises. On the 3rd of February 1978, he was rushed back to the hospital but died within an hour of his arrival. Puzzled by this seemingly healthy man's sudden death, the doctors requested that an autopsy was performed. Whilst awaiting the results of the autopsy, Detective Benson Phillips of the Lumberton Police Department received a call from a woman who stated that there had been not one but several murders. Initially dismissing this as a prank call, the detective began to take these claims more seriously when the woman called for a second time and not only mentioned Stuart's death, but also the fact that Velma had killed her mother. The caller was one of Velma's sisters. When the results of the autopsy were finalised, it was concluded that Stuart had died from arsenic poisoning. On the 13th of May 1978, Velma was arrested and charged with Stuart's murder. After her arrest, the body of her second husband, Jennings Barfield, was exhumed and was also found to contain traces of arsenic. She later confessed to murdering her mother, John Lee, and Montgomery and Dolly Edwards. She admitted that in each case she had laced her victim's food and drink with either Singletary Rat Killer or Terror Ant and Roach Killer. These are both odourless and tasteless substances that she had bought at a local store for about $1 per can. She maintained that she had never planned to kill anyone and that she had just wanted to make them sick for long enough for her to cover up the fact that she had been stealing from them in order to fund her drug addiction. Velma was only tried for Stuart's murder. The prosecutor at her trial, Joe Freeman Britt, was an ardent advocate of capital punishment, earning him the reputation of the world's deadliest prosecutor. He faced Velma's court-appointed defence attorney, Robert Jacobson, who was defending his first death penalty case. Robert's defence was that Velma was not guilty by reason of insanity caused by her excessive medication abuse. He argued that she had never meant to kill Stuart, rather just make him ill, in order to give her enough time to cover up the thefts and return the money that she had stolen from him. This defence was destroyed by the prosecution, who argued that Stuart could have been saved if the doctors treating him had been made aware that he had been poisoned, and also by bringing in details of the other people who had died at Velma's hands. When the prosecution questioned Velma in court, she came across as argumentative, cold and uncaring, even going so far as giving the prosecutor a sarcastic round of applause at the end of his closing statement. It took the jury less than 60 minutes to find Velma guilty of first degree murder and she was sentenced to death. She was imprisoned in Central Prison in Raleigh, North Carolina, in the area reserved for those who tried to escape or who had mental illnesses. At that time, there was no specific prison area for women on death row. During her time in prison, she was weaned off of the drugs that she had become so dependent on and became a devout Christian. She spent her final years ministering to the other prisoners. Unsuccessful appeals to her death sentence were made, including one made on the basis of testimony by Dorothy Otnow Lewis, a professor of psychiatry at New York University School of Medicine. She was an expert on violent behaviour. She claimed that Velma was suffering from disassociative identity disorder and that Velma had a second personality known as Billy. The professor stated that Billy had told her that Velma had been sexually abused and that he, Billy, had killed the abusers. The judge rejected the appeal, stating that, One of them did it, I don't care which one. Velma's fate was sealed and she issued a statement that, I know that everybody has gone through a lot of pain, all the families connected, and I am sorry, and I want to thank everybody who have been supporting me all these six years. After a last meal of cheese doodles, 
and Coca-Cola. Velma was executed by lethal injection and pronounced dead at 2.15am on the 2nd of November 1984, four days after her 52nd birthday. At the request of her son, she was buried near his father, Thomas Burke, in a remote cemetery in North Carolina. It is believed that before her death, she confessed to her son, Ronnie, that she had killed Thomas by starting the fire in the bedroom, where he was passed out from drinking. Velma was the first woman to be executed in the United States after capital punishment was reintroduced in 1976. She was also the first woman to be executed by lethal injection. That concludes today's case. Please add any comments down below, and thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Singer-songwriter Jonathan Bird is the grandson of Jennings Barfield and his first wife. His song Velma from his Wildflowers album gives a personal account of the murder and investigation. Goodbye. Hello and welcome back to The Crime Reel. For this week's true crime narration we shall be looking at the life of Kristen Gilbert an intelligent and charismatic young woman who turned her talents and skills to a life of murder. Born Kristen Heather Strickland in Fall River, Massachusetts on the 13th of November 1967. Kristen was the first child born to Richard and Claudia Strickland. Their second daughter was born seven years later in 1974. Richard worked as an electronics engineer whilst Claudia stayed at home raising their daughters and also at times worked as a supply teacher. Reports from Kristen's early life describe her as a well-behaved child who breezed through her classes. She enjoyed watching soap operas, she babysat local kids to earn money and joined the math club in what could be described as a very typical childhood. In the early 1980s, the family moved to Groton, Massachusetts, and it was around this time that Kristen's behaviour began to change. She began to show more and more signs of being a compulsive liar, with one of her most prolific lies being that she was related to Lizzie Borden. Lizzie, who also lived in Fall River, is known because of the brutal axe murder of her father and stepmother way back in 1893, a crime which she was accused but subsequently acquitted of. Kristen continued to excel at her classes and graduated from high school with honours over a year early. At the age of 16, she enrolled at Bridgewater State College. By this time, she had started to develop a pattern of verbal and physical abuse towards her boyfriends and ex-boyfriends. She would lie a lot and attempt to manipulate situations for her own gain. This manipulation in some cases would take the form of fake suicide attempts, including one time where she wrote a suicide note to her then boyfriend stating that she had eaten glass, all in an attempt to get people to do as she wished. On another occasion she convinced her college roommate that her mother was an abusive drunk in order to gain attention and sympathy. In the summer of 1986, at the age of 19, Kristen met the man who would go on to become her husband, Glenn Gilbert. By the following year, she had transferred schools to be closer to Glenn, and at the age of 20, also took a job as a home health assistant with the Visiting Nurses Association of Franklin County. It was here that the first report of any serious wrongdoing emerged. Whilst bathing a mentally ill child, she scalded his body with hot bath water. Little more is known of the incident and no formal charges were ever brought in this matter. In January 1988, Kristen and Glenn eloped. By now Glenn worked for an optical lens firm and the couple lived briefly in Greenfield and East Hampton before buying a home in the Florence section of Northampton. However, within a month of their marriage, it was reported that Kristen had chased her husband around the house with a butcher's knife following a heated argument. Later that year, Kristen graduated with a degree in nursing and on the 6th of March 1989, she took a job as a nurse at the Leeds Veterans Affairs Medical Centre in Massachusetts, working on Ward C. 22-year-old Kristen quickly became a popular and well-respected member of staff, 
she was recognised as having a can-do attitude and quickly established herself at the centre of the war's professional and social life. She was skillful in medical emergencies, remaining calm under pressure and admired for her competence. She was also the one who would organise Secret Santa, after-work drinks and gift drives for needy families. It was noticed that there was an unusually large number of deaths on Ward C, so much so that Kristen's colleagues jokingly and unknowingly gave her the nickname Angel of Death. However, Kristen's presence at a large number of these deaths was at least initially assumed to be due to her being a competent and composed member of staff who would often be called to difficult codes. In 1991, Kristen gave birth to her first child, a boy who she and Glenn named Brian. In 1993, on Kristen's 26th birthday, their second child Raymond was born. When she returned to work at the hospital in 1994, she was assigned the night shift and it was here that she met one of the hospital security guards, a Gulf War veteran named James Perrault. The pair soon became close friends and as Kristen hinted that her seven year marriage was on the rocks, this friendship grew from drinks after work into a full blown affair. Her husband Glenn had no knowledge of what was going on. In late July 1995, 66 year old Stanley Jagodowski was admitted to the hospital due to post-operative bowel obstructions. Stanley, a truck driver who was a veteran of the Korean War, had a history of chronic heart problems but was making good progress. On the 21st of August, his doctor recommended that he was moved from Ward C to a hospital home unit the following day. At 8.43pm that evening, he was checked by two nurses and found to be fine. Shortly afterwards, Kristen entered the room with a needle and swab in her hand to flush his IV line with saline. Within minutes, he had fallen into cardiac arrest. He died three hours later. Although Stanley had been progressing well, his history of heart problems meant that his death was not seen as suspicious. His death certificate stated that he died of natural causes, cardiorespiratory arrest, and an autopsy was not performed. Kristen's affair with James continued and in November 1995 he rented an apartment in East Hampton to be nearer to her. During this time Glenn remained unaware of the affair with the only change he noticed being that Kristen had started to prepare home cooked meals more frequently. At around this time Glenn remembers his meals beginning to taste a bit strange and Kristen had reportedly told a friend that it was her goal to have her husband out of the house by Thanksgiving. On the 5th of November 1995, Glenn was rushed to hospital after becoming violently ill. He was diagnosed with low potassium and glucose, treated and then sent home. Around a week later, Kristen told Glenn that she was not happy with the care that he had received, stating that she wanted to take her own blood sample, which she would get tested at work. She had two syringes. One contained a clear liquid, which she said was saline to flush his vein before drawing the blood. This is a dangerous procedure, which would not have been necessary. After the needle went into Glenn's arm, he became cold and lost consciousness. When he awoke moments later, Kristen told him that he had fainted at the sight of the needle. It was around this time that Kristen told James that she was being abused at home. James told her that she had to leave her husband. She became upset, but then walked to a payphone and called Glenn and said that she was leaving him. She moved out of the family home on the 1st of December 1995, leaving the boys in the care of their father. The following week, 35-year-old Air Force veteran Henry Houdon was admitted to the hospital at around 2pm suffering from vomiting and diarrhoea. During his preliminary examination, his heart was listed as regular and his cardiovascular system checked and listed as showing no problems. Henry had been an Air Force physical therapist until an accident had put an end to his career. When trying to break up a fight in a pizza restaurant, he was hit with a beer bottle and went down with such force that it detached his retina. He was in a coma for three weeks and when he awoke he was like a different person. He was argumentative, emotional, shaky and heard voices. He was subsequently diagnosed with schizophrenia for which he took medication and became a regular patient at the VA hospital. 
when he was admitted that December. He was sent to Ward C rather than the psychiatric ward that he was used to. He begged his family not to leave him there, screaming that people were dying around there for no reason. His family thought that this was another one of his delusions and left him at the hospital at 4.45pm that day. Just over an hour later, at 5.48pm, he went into cardiac arrest. He suffered three more heart attacks and died at 10pm that evening. His autopsy showed his cause of death as being undetermined. Later that month, on the same day that Kristen filed for divorce from Glenn, she became agitated when her requests to leave work early were denied. Shortly after her request, 72-year-old World War II veteran Francis Marrier went into cardiac arrest. He was stabilised and survived. A similar situation occurred the following January when Thomas Callahan was admitted to the hospital with pneumonia and pulmonary disease. Shortly after his admission, he lapsed into a deadly cardiac arrhythmia, but staff managed to stabilise him and he also survived. On the 2nd of February of 1996, Kristen made her most brazen request to her supervisor. If the one seriously ill patient on the ward was to die, would she be allowed to leave work early that day? The patient in question was 41-year-old Kenneth Cutting, a US Army veteran who had been a patient at the hospital for 20 years. Kenneth had multiple sclerosis, was blind and was subject to a do not resuscitate order. Despite his health being stable at the time of Kristen's request, he died of a heart attack just 40 minutes later. Shortly after that, Kristen left work for the day. Just two days later, on the 4th of February, Angelo Vella recalls being treated by Kristen. He remembers her putting something in his IV, starting to feel flushed and hot, then experiencing stomach and chest pain before passing out. Angelo's heart rate reached 300 beats per minute before he was eventually stabilised. It had now reached the point where the number of deaths surrounding Kristen were too high to ignore. On the 17th of February 1996, three of her fellow nurses, John Wall, Kathy Ricks and Renee Walsh, came forward with their concerns about the high numbers of cardiac arrests that occurred when Kristen was working. An investigation began and Kristen was being watched by many of her colleagues. Although they had their suspicions, nobody had any proof. The day after Kristen was reported, 68-year-old World War II veteran Edward Squira of Williamsburg went into cardiac arrest. He died three days later with his death certificate stating that his cause of death was a dissecting aneurysm. At the time of his death, it was discovered that three vials of epinephrine were missing from the hospital supply. Epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, can cause cardiac arrest if given in large enough doses. Aware of the investigation, Kristen left the VA hospital on medical leave after claiming that she had sustained a shoulder injury whilst working. However, she kept up with what was happening with the investigation through James, who believed that she was innocent and wanted to support her. The mortality rates between shifts that Kristen worked and those that she didn't were compared. When she joined the evening shift, the death rate tripled compared to the previous three years. When she left the overnight shift in late 1990, the death rate dropped back to 1988 levels. It appeared that death followed Kristen from shift to shift. Kristen was interviewed on the 8th of March 1996, during which she claimed that the high number of deaths during her shifts were merely a coincidence and that her numbers were artificially inflated because licensed practical nurses and nursing assistants look up to her as the best in codes and they run to get her and bring her to a patient in distress. As Kristen's frustrations with the investigation grew, her relationship with James became strained. When he attempted to end their relationship in June 1996, Kristen checked herself into a psychiatric hospital. Ongoing, she continued to check in and out of various psychiatric facilities for a few days at a time, and it was during one such stay that she confessed to James that she was guilty. You know I did it. I did it. You wanted to know. I killed those guys. Then she hung up the phone. The federal grand jury began hearing testimony in July 1996, calling James 
Glenn and many of Kristen's co-workers to testify. When her apartment was searched, investigators found a book called The Handbook of Poisoning. Upon finding out that James and Glenn were cooperating with the authorities, Kristen became abusive and threatening towards the pair. Then, in an attempt to derail the investigation, Kristen called the VA hospital on the 26th of September 1996 with a false bomb threat. This led to both the evacuation of 50 critically ill patients and then to Kristen's arrest. On the 2nd of November 1996, she was indicted on felony charges for falsely phoning a bomb threat to a federal institution. As the press began to circulate, she seemed more concerned about her appearance in news articles than the gravity of what she had done, even going so far as to suggest that Bridget Fonda should play her in the movie of her life. As Kristen awaited her trial for the bomb threat, the investigation into deaths at the hospital continued. Edward Squira and Kenneth Cutting's bodies were exhumed and tested for the presence of epinephrine. In April 1998, Kristen was found guilty of phoning in a bomb threat and sentenced to 15 months in prison. While serving this sentence, she was charged with the murders of Henry Huden, Kenneth Cutting and Edward Squira and the attempted murders of Thomas Callahan and Angelo Vela. Kristen protested her innocence. Her father, Richard, spoke in her defence stating that his daughter was not a mass murderer and that the investigation had been triggered by a statistical anomaly. Stanley Jagodowski's remains were also exhumed and following tests to establish the presence of epinephrine, Kristen was also charged with his murder. She was also charged with the attempted murder of Francis Marier. The prosecutors alleged that she had committed many more crimes for which she had not been charged, including attempting to murder the same person by poisoning on two separate occasions in November 1995, trying to murder a patient in the VA hospital on January 28, 1996, causing a medical emergency by removing a patient's breathing tube at the VA hospital on January 30, 1994, abandoning a patient undergoing a cardiac arrest on November 9, 1995. She then asked another nurse to accompany her to check on the patient and waited for that colleague to spot the patient's difficulty before raising the alarm. Refusing to use the cardiac defibrillation paddles on a patient during an emergency, thereby forcing an untrained colleague to perform this procedure on the 17th of November 1995 and threatening the life of at least one person both verbally and physically in July 1996. Kristen's murder trial in front of a jury of nine women and three men got underway on the 20th of November 2000. There were over 70 witnesses called and over 200 pieces of evidence. Both Glenn and James testified for the prosecution about Kristen's behaviour towards them and her confession. The prosecution speculated that she enjoyed being in an emergency situation and wanted to impress her boyfriend James with her proficiency as a nurse. They went on to state that hospital records could not account for 88 of the 135 vials of epinephrine dispensed to Ward C between August 20th 1995 and February 17th 1996, which was the period when Kristen was allegedly killing. They also provided details of the empty vials of epinephrine that had been found in rooms where Kristen had been claiming to use saline. Kristen's defence team argued that there was reasonable doubt due to the lack of direct evidence connecting Kristen to any of the deaths. They claimed that the victim's deaths were from natural causes. They argued that the method used by the laboratory to trace epinephrine in the embalmed, buried and then exhumed bodies of the victims was unreliable particularly as epinephrine could have been given in legitimate attempts to save their lives. They stated that the hospital's record keeping, which was subsequently revised, had been seriously lacking and that many of the so-called missing epinephrine vials may have been discarded due to their expiration date passing. It was calculated that in the seven years that Kristen had worked at the VA, she was on duty for around half of the 350 deaths that had occurred there. The chances of this being a coincidence were a astronomical 1 in 100 million. 
On the 14th of March 2001, 33-year-old Kristen was found guilty of three counts of first-degree murder for the deaths of Henry Huden, Kenneth Cutting and Edward Squirer. Also for one count of second-degree murder for the death of Stanley Jagodowski and two counts of attempted murder in the cases of Angelo Vella and Thomas Callahan. She was acquitted of the attempted murder charge in the case of Francis Marier. Although Massachusetts abolished the death penalty in 1984, Kristen's crimes occurred on federal property, meaning that the jury could sentence her to death under federal law. However, the jury did not unanimously agree to this, and on the 27th of March 2001, Kristen was sentenced to four consecutive life terms without the possibility of parole plus an additional 20 years. She was transferred to a federal prison in Carswell, Texas, where she has remained ever since. On the 25th of July 2003, Kristen dropped her federal appeal for a new trial due to the possibility of the death penalty being pursued. Kristen was convicted of four murders and two attempted murders, but there has been a great deal of speculation as to how many deaths and medical emergencies she is actually responsible for. With 350 deaths occurring during her shifts at the hospital, coupled with the frequency of the attacks that we actually know about, it seems right to speculate that she could in fact be responsible for many, many more. That concludes today's case, the story of Kristen Gilbert. My thanks go out to Liz Pease for suggesting that I cover this case. Please add any comments down below and click like. And if you're new to the channel, please consider subscribing. Thanks very much for listening to The Crime Reel. Stay safe. Goodbye. Psst. Since Kristen's conviction, some high school and college colleagues have said that she used to threaten many of her classmates. Goodbye.